start because we're already a little bit over the time. So first, I would like to welcome everybody uh, to this uh, session today here. Um, normally, we have now a presenter with us, uh, which is Adnan Siddiq. I'm very glad uh, that he is a main presenter, and he, I'm glad that he's presenting uh, within this uh, webinar. However, I would like to give before a little bit of perspective and an overview of what React is, because the presentation of Adnan Siddiq is in the frame of the technical committee React. And therefore, I have some slides uh, before we start with the, with the main presentation. So let us just go through what is React in terms of abbreviation. It stands for Remote Sensing Environment Analysis and Climate Technology. So that's the main uh, abbreviation. And these tells you already uh, when you look to the, uh, to the title that but uh, one very important component is remote sensing and using remote sensing for environment and for analysis, but also to, to check out uh, technology where we can monitor, let me say, climate change and climate issues are the main um, motivation of having uh, this technical committee. We, ha we have quite a lot of people in this uh, REACT committee. Uh, you see here some faces on the screen. I will not go through all this names now, but uh, the team is slowly increasing and I'm very happy about it. And one the main part probably, if you just look to the different countries which are included. So we are very in an international uh, team with a lot of different backgrounds uh, and expertise. So let us start with uh, what the main motivation is with React. Uh, so as I as said, so which stands already in the title of React itself is remote sensing and we like to use remote sensing tools uh, and maps and information content in order to give some, in, uh, to, to provide some information for uh, global societal challenges that we are facing nowadays uh, even more and more. So this is only an, an example of where we can contribute to different um, parts with remote sensing. So we can contribute to climate change. As an example, you see, for example, monitoring of glacier velocities or even mass balance issues. An example is over environment. So we can see where degradation or deforestation is ongoing. For resources, we can mine or we can observe how resources are taken. Here, for example, a copper mine, uh, that is one of the biggest, let me say, holes that you find on Earth uh, where copper is uh, digged out and material is deposited close to it. We can also have um, views in terms of using uh, sustainable development, for example, subsidence measurements over Mexico, where we know that we have a lot of, uh, or a big reservoir, groundwater re uh, reservoir uh, beneath uh, Mexico City, and we can observe very well from space how uh, this reservoir is taken, so how much water is taken out of this reservoir. Uh, and this is also very strongly contributing uh, to processes and to monitoring uh, climate issue and changes and resources. Uh, we can do uh, mapping of mega cities, um, mobilities. I'm just going now faster through it. Hazards, uh, it's very important to us. For example, here, volcano monitoring um, and also uh, earthquake monitoring, or even looking for disasters and providing very, very fast feedback and information content in terms of map. Uh, for example, flooding, flooding maps, so where you see where flooding is ongoing and how we can, um, and which infrastructure are, let me say, um, inside this flooding region, which are the red dots, uh, which are smaller settlements here, so really to see and to bring very fast help uh, to these people. So this is how remote sensing can help in terms of uh, global climate change and societal challenges, and therefore we have uh, compiled very newly uh, this new technical committee at GRSS, which is in principle React. React is, um, is in principle should be a venue for all scientists that are connecting to each other in order to exchange experience, but also knowledge, also data uh, and technology in, in principle. So the main idea is uh, in, in in terms of advancing also, so we exchange all the ideas and share knowledge in terms of advancing science and 
for example, also defined requirements that we have on mission proposals. Um, and this is mainly done for, for different uh, parts, for the cryosphere, for the biosphere, also hydrosphere, atmosphere, geosphere, and let me say also for the human population also in, in urban areas. How we are doing this networking? So we started to work now in focused areas, in local focused areas to be more precise because our definition is very broad, which means it's good to be broad because it's also good to include other topics that are of main interest and to exchange on these topics. But now we started to work in more detailed, let me say, or more focused on, on specific areas, which are, for example, uh, the issues that Pacific Islands have due to uh, sea level rise. So Pacific Islands, agriculture and food security in India, for example, floods and water security in Africa and um, the Hindu Kush Karakoram Himalaya area, uh, this, which is also called as the third pole uh, that we have. And a lot of changes are ongoing due to uh, global warming. To each of these local focused areas, we have uh, leads which are leading these areas and the exchange within these smaller groups. And again, the motivation here is to gather the community to work together, uh, to exchange method and techniques um, that are all related to SDGs and climate change issues. And uh, where we have a principal, probably local problems that could be transferred also to global uh, issues. Um, yeah, and the main idea behind is really to have this different expertise and the international community coming together to work on this topic and to help to understand much better uh, what is ongoing um, globally. Uh, just to go very shortly to our what we are doing, uh, these are the topics that we have and probably more to see what are the actions that we had. So we just recently had a proposal on EO4 SDG, which means we had announced uh, that uh, smaller proposals could be submitted on, on smaller topics uh, or projects that people had or students had in these local regions. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, the deadline for this year's uh, competition is already over, and we will announce uh, the winners uh, in the webinar on December six. So if you're available, you're you're happy to join us. However, the deadlines for the next um, competition can be can be already announced for 2023, where we will place the first announcement again in May. We will have a proposal uh, submission deadline in September, and then we would have potentially in November or December, again, uh, a kind of workshop where we announce again the, um, uh, the winners of the contest of next year. Um, yes. So probably other current activities that we are doing. So we have webinars as this one, that's now the one that will be held by Anand Siddiq as the next speaker. But then the next one will be again, uh, will be end of November, 30th of November. And this will be given on the topic agriculture and food, and food security from Avi Bhattacharya from India. Uh, and then please check out the next days for dates for next year, uh, where we will have another dates and a kind of series of webinars um, in order to report a little bit of our activities. Another event is that we are represented on an ocean geos a geospatial conference in Noumea. And this is mainly dealing uh, with the Pacific Island issues that we have here and React will be presented on this in this session. Uh, as well as also we have already uh, con contributed or community contributed sessions uh, for IGERS 2023, uh, where you're welcome to join and also to contribute to it. So you can reach out in order to, if you have some contribution that you think uh, are, are, are in this domain of monitor, uh, uh, monitoring floods and impacts, then you, you're welcome to submit your abstracts here or even to cryosphere hazards in the HKH region. And uh, a very new thing uh, from last week and this week, uh, we were uh, we had launched a new video about React, which were presented at COP twenty seven. Um, very um, yeah, very great in order to really show what remote sensing can do and what React is trying to compile in terms of a bottom up approach uh, to gather the scientists and the knowledge of the scientists to help understand better climate uh, issues. 
Okay, and if you're interested, and I triggered a little bit your interest in what we are doing further on, um, you can be also a part of React. Uh, you just need to go to the website under grss-ieee.org. Uh, and you go un under uh, technical committees, you uh, select React and you can join in principle as a member so that you get newsletters and information about uh, what we are doing. Yeah, that's just my short uh, overview of what React is. And I'm very, very happy now that um, Adnan Siddiq uh, will provide you more insight about one of the specific topics uh, that we are dealing with um, and he will present the activities within this uh, HK, HKH region. Thanks a lot. And I give over now to Adnan Siddiq. Uh, thank you, Irena. Uh, I hope my slides are visible. No, it's another screen. Okay, uh, just give me a minute, please. And, uh... Uh, I hope they are visible now. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you, Irena, uh, for a very nice introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, today, I will be presenting some highlights of the work that me and my team have been doing. Um, basically, they are efforts towards large-scale monitoring of glacial lakes and potential glacial lake floods in the HKH region. The talk is within the context of React, and like Irena mentioned, the focus area that we have recently launched, uh, namely cryosphere changes and hazards in the HKH. Um, so I will quickly acknowledge my team members. Uh, I will be presenting some highlights of the different works that uh, my colleagues have been contributing to over time. Um, so to give you a quick idea of what do we mean exactly by HKH, so Hindu Kush Himalayan, these mountain ranges, they extend over a very large area, which is covering several countries, in fact. So extending from Afghanistan to Pakistan, India, a very significant part of China, and also in Nepal, Bangladesh, Myanmar. So it's uh, a very large area and um, the, the fact is that this entire region combined has more glacial ice uh, than anywhere on Earth uh, after the polar regions. So that means it, it's a very important area in the context of global warming uh, when we are experiencing a recession of several glaciers. Uh, an estimated total area, is, is as stated here, is more than 60,000 square kilometer. Uh, but even these statistics, they are changing rapidly over every following year. So stating a number here is already difficult these days. And uh, just in Pakistan, we have more than 7,000 glaciers covering an area of more than 17,000 square kilometer. In fact, it contains 75% of the stored water supply. And that is, uh, I think, a good evidence to show the importance of uh, glaciers and the ice mass they contain in the context of uh, the coming uh, decades when warming would take place more and uh, more of the glaciers are expected to melt. The, the flip side of this is that there are a lot of people who are actually inhabited, inhabiting regions, uh, valleys within the mountains. <clears throat> and that means that any sort of hazard that is triggered due to climate change related issues uh, can affect those people. So in the Gilgit, Baltistan and KP regions in, in northern Pakistan, there are already 7.1 million people uh, living in vulnerable regions. And uh, with uh, increasing risks of landslides, rock falls, earthquakes, flash floods, there has been a recurring loss of lives and property, particularly in the last decade or so. Now, since I would be focusing a bit more on the GLOFs here, uh, I would take a moment to uh, explain um, what do I exactly mean by them with an example. So 
on the right hand side here you see um, a, gla a glacier which is called Shishper actually and uh, in the zoom in insets you see that the glacier has surged a lot and the snout of this glacier which you see here in the optical image has actually extended to this far that the the from the other side the flow of water has been stopped so that means an ice dammed lake has been created now over time the the volume of this lake grows especially in the summer when the glaciers are melting more and eventually it becomes too much that it cannot be sustained any further and it can lead to bursting but when the burst happens there is a discharge of several millions of cubic meters of water alongside debris in it and that debris basically wipes out just about everything in its past in its path so just sharing you with you some numbers here that uh, in 2019 a GLOF event uh, in Chetral Valley uh, actually led to a damage of more than 1 billion euros and uh, the infrastructure was so badly damaged that it broke, um, it damaged highways and it also damaged power plants. Interestingly, the same glacier burst again the following year in 2020, which meant, which was very surprising because uh, these gloves repeating year after year means that uh, some climate change adaptation should have happened already. And now we are putting the people at so much risk that every season they may have to prepare for potential uh, movement or, or uh, preparations to save their livelihoods. So if we look a bit more into the science of this, the, the lakes can be of very different types. Like the one I, met, I stated, uh, one I showed before was an ice dammed lake, but then we also have moraine dammed lake or supraglacial lakes, which are cirque type and so on. And uh, these, the frequency of gloves, which we have been in which we have which we are observing to be increasing over time is quite likely um, because of the warming that has been happening in the in the let's say the high mountain asia part which is actually warming um, according to some recent papers at double the global average rate so it's 0 0.32 degrees per decade compared to the global average which stands around 0 0.16 centigrade per decade so that means that we really need to take actions towards uh, characterizing it uh, better. Uh, this here again shows uh, a, a figure that I took from uh, from uh, a recent uh, book that shows the, the glacial lake outburst floods uh, from 1930 to 2000. And we can already see that there is a very sharply increasing trend of cloths and um, but now coming towards what can be done in the in the context of science we, there are still very large gaps um, when it comes to um, understanding the cause effect relationships and how are how is this uh, continued melting in globes is going to have a long long-term impact on on the climate change scenario so in, in that context, it is imperative to adopt a large scale monitoring method, like we can't focus on one, just one Shishpur case or just one Chitral Valley case, rather we need to look at the entire region because it seems to be uh, interdependent to some extent, which in other words means that we have to uh, utilize machine learning based techniques that would allow us eventually to reap the big remote sensing data. But we have to keep this also in mind that AI or ML-based techniques would require sufficient amount of labeled data to achieve meaningful results. So with this limitation in mind, what sort of models are we going to train or would we need to be trained? In one aspect, we could be training models that can predict when a lake is about to burst, like when a glow is about to happen. And that would mean that we need to have a sufficiently large database of cloths at hand to be able to train that model and despite the fact like i showed in the previous slide that we have an inventory of cloths over uh, the starting from 1930s but that was the time when satellite imagery was not as prevalent as in the current age after the advent of the sentinels and other missions that are acquiring regularly and providing data so 
another aspect is to focus on the on those aspects that we can follow with let's say computer vision style uh, machine learning and processing like detecting the presence of lakes seasonal ones from season to season and uh, then trying to follow the evolution of those lakes so all in all this would require data typically SAR optical as well as weather data parameters from hydrology, terrain, steepness of slopes, mass balance measurements, surface velocities, all those features that we are actually uh, observing or measuring in the domains of glacial hydrology, remote sensing, interferometry, and so on. Now, just to show you uh, the inventory of GLOFs starting from 2013 onwards. That's the time when, let's say, we started gathering uh, Sentinels data. And we managed to reap about 67 events in this time, which, and out of those 67, we could verify 56 from pre and post like imagery. And 17 of them were in the HKH region. Now, in this effort, or let's say during this effort, we started categorizing what sort of cloths have happened and what was the, the area or the volume of the lake prior to bursting and what was the altitude, whether it was a moraine dammed or an ice dammed lake or something else. And all those factors that could potentially help us to build uh, machine learning models later on. But still, the data set isn't large enough to, to help us give statistically sound results. But that also means that maybe more efforts are needed from other stakeholders, scientists and engineers who are working uh, in other countries, uh, even in South America or, or Asia or high mountain uh, Asia part in China, and maybe collate uh, databases that can eventually be used for GLOF models later on. So uh, just to, to show you a small animation like thing that if we look at what sort of uh, glaciers are contributing a lot to GLOFs these days, they actually tend to be those which are not too big. Like in, in, the, uh, in the very high mountain Asia part where we have glaciers at 6,000 and above uh, meters above sea level, uh, there are also glaciers which are just about two square kilometer in the western side of HKH, and we they they have a higher they seem to have a higher tendency of bursting. Like this case, in this case, there was a glow in 2015, then in 19, then again in 2021, and the the, the sporadic habitations that I have marked on the on the figure, they are the ones that have been damaged, getting damaged from time to time. So, um, it's. If, if we try to follow the evolution of the of a glacial lake that is the cause of this glove on, on this Dokpal glacier, you can see that in 2019, uh, in subsequent Sentinel-2 images, the, the, the lake actually grew very rapidly. So from just from, from June 2018 to 28, its mass, has a, its volume had actually doubled. And by the by July 8, the lake actually burst. So within a span of, let's say, four to six weeks, a phenomenon took place and it caused so much damage. And since we could also see it in afterwards in Sentinel-2 images, it gives a sort of motivation that perhaps we could have looked it or we could have followed it in time and be able to gener generate an alert maybe that something is happening here and it's, a, it's, it's rather an anomaly. And that then obviously helps us to think about anomaly detection in, in terms of machine learning. But just showing you the next year, what happened was again, more or less the same case that from June, mid of June to mid of July, uh, within a month, uh, again, the, the lake grew so much that it became unsustainable and another glove happened. Now, since we were just working with Sentinel-2 images here, we thought about uh, making a data set out of it and uh, release it on IEEE data port. So we had about, we collected about 1200 uh, images over HKH uh, for different lakes that had the potential to burst or, or otherwise, but they're just for sure glacial lakes. And after doing the necessary um, pre-processing typical for Sentinel-2 images, 
we 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 trained a model on that with 1000 images and keeping 200 images for training and testing and uh, just to show you which models we we applied here we went for the unit with efficient net b0 backbone it follows the encoder decoder style where you have complex low level feature extraction in the encoder part and then you have a decoder part using the pre-trained weights from ImageNet and then following on with some training uh, we managed to achieve decent results and the intersection over union score was about 79.9 percent and it was uh, reasonable in the sense that the if we that we had achieved, uh, we have significantly reduced false neg negatives. But here I'm still showing you some cases that are very interesting. Uh, like in the first row here, the, the the predictions have been pretty good. And even those very small lakes that are here, which are sometimes a challenge to see, we were able to, to predict them accurately. But here we missed it. It's an error because there was a lake, but its radiometry is so different that the model wasn't able to pick it. And then again, here we were able to pick something that looked like a lake and going back, uh, it does. So it was, it means that maybe the ground truth here need, needed to improve. But then again, we went back to the same glacier, the Dokpal case, and tried to see what does our model say for 2021. Now, we had made some uh, field visits to the glacier as well, and uh, we knew that the authorities were actually quite vigilant about it, and they were ready to pump out excess water from the lake in advance so that it doesn't become so enormous to cause bursting, but still we were trying to follow it. Here I'm showing you false color images, but again from Sentinel-2. So from June 2022 to July 27, again, there was a uh, formation of something, but it's hard to characterize whether this was ablation ice or a lake. And once we put it to a classifier, it would say there is no lake. And that was another uh, pointer for us to think more about it, that sometimes the lake's radiometry can be so uh, ab uh, abnormal, let's say, that it would be very hard to distinguish it from clear water body. And in that case, a model that is simply trained in optical images might not work very well. So we need to improve uh, our source of uh, data somehow. So with this motivation, we, we first thought, okay, if for this particular case, if it truly was a lake and we were just not able to see it properly, would it actually cause a damage to the settlement? And the, the a simple flood model actually said that yes, within 30 minutes it would be, uh, it would hit the settlements and uh, it would hit at a velocity which would be about 35 to 40 kilometers per hour, and that is already too fast to break down almost every housing structure or road infrastructure that that exists there. So, <clears throat> with these things motivating us, we thought about that we really need to have an updated glacial lake inventory so that we can collect more data, we can go from Sentinel-2 to Sentinel-1 and maybe combine or do some data fusion and try to improve the modeling process. So this slide here shows basically shapefiles of the different lakes that we identified. And interestingly, this number came out to be 5,216, <clears throat> which is almost twice the number of lakes that were uh, <clears throat> suggested back in 2013, uh, yes, back in 2013. So it means that within a decade, the number of glacial lakes only in the Pakistani part of HKH had almost doubled. And that is uh, really um, something that is, of course, bothering, because if the number of lakes that tend to appear can can double so so much it means that men, there can be many pockets of habitations that are now potentially at risk because people were never used to having a glacial lake on top of their heads and now if it bursts it would cause damage so we we also just made a quick analysis of uh, what sort what's the size of these lakes and whether or whether most of them are very large or very small. So most of them actually tend to be between 
or let's say less than two square kilometer, which is also a very large lake, if you, if you say so. So, so many of them are actually uh, here around one, which is still uh, a cause of concern. And using these shape files, we first thought about going into multispectral, involving more uh, bands, let's say. So we use planet scope imagery. Uh, one of the good things about planet scope here was that you get an image every day. So it reduces the cloud cloud factor significantly that, that bothers a lot in HKH region because it's mountains and you always more or less have a cloudy weather and it's sometimes very difficult to get a clear picture. So uh, with Planet, we managed to get about 4,000 uh, images uh, over the same shape files. And then we again went for a machine learning approach and we could get about 72.81% of IOU score here. And again, here one can see that the radiometry is again quite variant. So it's, 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 it remains a challenge, but it is uh, still a good direction to, to maybe approach it further in an operational sense. But in order to really avoid this uh, uh, cloud factor, we have to go to SAR in any case. And secondly, when it comes to uh, radiometric issues, it makes sense to go to Sentinel-1 again and try to do some polarimetric or co interferometric coherence analysis and other parameters that SAR can tell us. So we made a quick experiment here, which is not too fancy, but it's still a starting point where we actually stacked RGB from Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 backscatter and tried to put it again into a machine learning model. Now here the score really went down to around 60%, but that is more because it's very critical here now to distinguish between the shadows and the lakes because the, the SAR shadows that occur just because of the slant range viewing geometry of SAR tend to get mis misclassified as lakes. And that ruins your figure of merit. So one way could be that we just try to remove uh, those crops from the training process, which has SAR shadows, but that would again be a sort of not a very cool thing in my opinion. So we are trying to work more on on trying to fix this problem, uh, but we uh, we have we are hopeful that we'll, we'll be able to actually do better data fusion and improve upon the scores rather than uh, re reducing them. But then here another challenge that has to be kept in mind is that SAR's viewing geometry is very different, of course and optical is narrow looking here. So both of them have to be geocoded and brought into the same uh, reference system before any stacking has to happen. Therefore, labeling efforts would have to be uh, done carefully. Uh, hopefully we will be releasing these data sets also for other people to experiment and uh, make them better. And then again, velocity estimation is a very important factor. Uh, for bigger glaciers, we can go for Dean-Sar based fancier methods, but um, let's say if, if you're just working with Sentinel, for example, then um, here you can see that uh, we, we have rather very generalized or smoothened out estimates of the glacier velocity because it's just two square kilometer of, of glacier. So it's not a very big one. And uh, um, it, we actually would have done better, I think, if we had X-band imagery here from Terrasat X or similar. And then I think for, for these smaller glaciers, it's important to, to have actually uh, high resolution imagery. But just to have a baseline here, uh, we, we collected Sentinel-1 data over this Rogeli glacier, and after using restituted orbits and the same pre-processing steps typical, uh, we, we just used ESA snap offset tracking, uh, and we computed these results here. Uh, but what's the long term, long longer term goal for us to try to automate everything and maybe develop a, a cloud cloud based um, method where we can automatically ingest remote sensing data from radar and optical sensors. As of now, Google Earth Engine is a very good option, but if we have to move towards polarimetry or interferometry, then it's not useful because uh, Google Earth Engine doesn't keep uh, complex data, so it only has backscatter, uh, but backscatter-based change detection can still be ingested. 
And then uh, we have the classifier for the lake. And uh, if after integrating glacier velocity and um, it's also a work in progress, we aren't finished with it yet. And all, another thing we need to work on is the automated delineation of the glacial lake boundaries here. So hopefully in a, we will be able to develop a web interface that would act as a standalone uh, method or a window into HKH and uh, people can uh, improve it over time and uh, maybe use it as a as a foundation for further um, uh, improvements. So um, before I uh, go towards the end of my uh, talk, I would also mention that it is very important to do public engagements. This we realized after making repeated field visits to Chitral Valley Glaciers, Dokpal, because the people here are very simple and they they haven't been exposed to these dangers in the past and the, the current generation is taking the brunt of it. So some of them were quite aggressive in talking to us because they first thought perhaps that we are the ones who are causing these things even, or one of them gave this statement in the local language Urdu here that whenever you people come here, something happens. So it was actually because something is happening. That's why people tend to go there and do some field work and do some measurements. But there were simple people who were not used to this sort of uh, investigative works there. And uh, the older people even thought about, okay, maybe the public authorities are just throwing uh, salt up there and making things melt. So I think it's very important to talk to these people again and try to tell them that we have to take adaptation measures. We have to get ready for uh, things, worse things, and uh, be able to sustain the lifestyle still. So I just thought to put a slide here and emphasize this point. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for listening. Uh, and uh, most of the things that I have shown you are very brief highlights of the work that we have done. Uh, but I think the main objective here was to sensitize the audience and to uh, bring you all to the importance of uh, perhaps joining hands and uh, making things better compared to what they currently stand at. So do think about joining React. And uh, if you are interested in the cryosphere related hazards in the HKH, uh, I will be happy to, to, to be in contact with you. So thank you and uh, back to Irena. Thanks a lot, uh, Adnan, for this great overview of uh, the research topics that you're dealing with. And uh, I mean, there are many, many more topics that need to be dealt with in this region. Uh, and I'm really happy that Adnan took the lead of uh, this group, which will work together in this area with the different partners. Yeah, thanks a lot also to point out that it's important to involve uh, local people, that's very important. And I think this is also what we like to do or to engage to. We like to do the networking and we have this expertise, but we like also to go out or to reach out, let me say, to local people and to explain what we are doing and how we can help them to monitor things and changes. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think this was really perfect and great. Now we have still some, yeah, thanks, sorry. <laughs> Okay, now I think we have some time for some questions from the audience. So you're welcome to ask questions to Adnan or to myself. I see already some of the questions are posed in the chat. I can also read the chat or if you like, you can just speak up. Uh, you just unmute yourself and uh, make you, yourself visible and you can pose a question and we will try to handle this. Um, yeah. Do you, somebody likes to start, for example, Abdul, Rahim, do you like to start with the first question? I think probably, I'm not sure, yes. Uh, perhaps I can read out the question that Abdul yeah, Rahim. you can also read out the one, yes. Uh, so he has uh, suggested, uh, he has added multiple sub-questions there. Firstly, does unstable surroundings have an impact on a plus possible glove event like debris, uh, spe specifically in case of black glaciers? If yes, then how the early warning system take that into account? 
also how would we detect the lakes built within the glaciers like the water inside a hollow glacier and making the walls <clears throat> weak from the inside i think these are very relevant questions and uh, definitely the unstable surroundings have an impact on on possible glof events and uh, in one of my slides where i was showing the glof inventory that we have made after the two after 2013 using remote sensing imagery uh, most of the lakes that uh, have burst and we have identified them in pre and post style uh, exploratory analysis they were moraine damped lakes so uh, so sometimes moraine tends to be loose it doesn't remain too strong uh, because it's comprising of again uh, debris and rock mass and if the water here is flowing out from some channel and it's washing it out I think it can lead to weakening of the moraine wall around and if the wall gets too weak it can definitely tend to to break I think uh, a geologist might be able to answer it even better uh, but I think it yes it definitely has an impact and when you refer to black glaciers I think you tend to to the fact that many of the glaciers in the HKS they they, they look very blackish because of the debris inside them and uh, I think it has an impact there has been some studies on uh, whether the debris is actually going to cause more uh increase the tendency to absorb more heat or the other way around so i think that's still a sort of a question um i think i do not have the best answer for that whether that is going to actually lead the glacier to absorb more heat if it if that's the case then it will have an impact uh, but if it's the other way around then it might be a little bit of a blessing there and regarding your question about early warning uh, the the Dokpal Glacier example that I'm showing you here in 2020, 2019 and 2020, both years there were cloths, but in 2021, we were very active about it right from the beginning and we were following it. So we had reported it to the authorities already, like a couple of weeks, 10 days more or less in advance, that it, it might tend towards uh, a, a bigger lake formation but then again there was a doubt whether it was ablation ice on top or just an ablation ice so authorities did go there and they actually took some uh, water pump like devices I would say that they tried to pump out water from them if it was possible I think there is a lot of debate and uh, no clear answer to what should be the way of doing an intervention in this case and uh, whether it makes sense to dig out channels and and artificially drain the lake or not so in their opinion it was necessary to do it to drain it artificially and not let more water gather in in inside the glacier and your last question was about uh, lakes that are within the glaciers yes there are and glacial lakes and those sort of lakes tend to be uh, not visible from from uh, from the top but like i mentioned if we move towards uh, interferometry uh, polarimetry and we try to to develop methods that can actually do some penetration not just remain on the surface level like optical images then we might be able to look into that uh, unfortunately i don't have an example yet but Irena's group is working on, on those aspects where they're also looking at polarimetric variables. And I think maybe in future, if we might be able to show some examples where it's doable or not doable, uh, it's, it's still an open question in my opinion. But definitely if the lakes are tens of meters down the surface, then it might be difficult. But if there's just an ablation ice thing that the lake surface has thin ice on top, then we might be able to to give a good answer uh, that I could not give uh, from, from as of now, and it's still a question mark for me whether it was inflation ice or not. So okay, uh, there was one hand raised up. Probably we start with this because before, <laughs> otherwise we can read again. So I think it was Carlos Lopez who had a question. He at least was raising hand. Yeah, if I I would like to to make a question, if I may. Sure. 
Sure. So, Adnan, first of all, I really congratulate you for the presentation. It's really, really great what you presented. I mean, I was really amazingly surprised by, by everything. But I have two questions. Uh, first of all, I mean, one uh, of the ideas is about the comment given by Abdul on debris, on the movement of the terrain. Did you think about to consider differential interferometry to combine or or to, to be sensitive to the movement of the terrain and if this is related with the with the problems in the legs? Yes, uh, uh, the consideration is there, but I haven't yet implemented it. Okay. Uh, we tried to do it once and for this particular glacier, when I computed mm -hmm. coherence or time series of co interferometric coherence, mm -hmm. it didn't tell me anything because Again, Sentinel has a bigger pixel size, rather too big compared to a two square kilometer glacier. Mm -hmm. So there, the, the, the boundary of the glacier and the corresponding mountains, they were all garbled up. And uh, if, if I had, let's say a better, higher resolution SAR image, um, I, may, I might have seen something mm -hmm. useful or, or nicer, uh, but yeah, no, not yet. Okay. But, but, but your point is very relevant. Yes, we I, should do it. Uh, yeah, and another question related with the use of SAR. Normally, you are using SAR in mon on mountains where the SAR has a lot of distortions. Uh, yeah. Is this a source of problem to use SAR there, or it's, I mean, or you didn't have too many troubles with this idea? And also combining ascending descending because I mean for us our experience is that on mountains SAR is quite much more difficult to handle the data in there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's very difficult to handle SAR there, and um, we of the layover and the shadows are too mm -hmm. strong. Yeah. Uh, like even in this case, the valley was around sixteen thousand meters. And mm -hmm. the glacier is at 4,400 uh, meters above sea level. So, and the, the lateral distance, let's say sort of horizontally, would not be more than 20 kilometers. So it's such a steep rise from the valley to the, to the glacier top there that it's, uh, it's really not very unlikely that you would, you would ever get to see it without a layer or a shadow one way or another okay. descending. Uh, so that is definitely one problem, um, but we still think that for other glaciers where the geometry would be suitable, we should still try to go with SAR. Uh, perhaps if you recall the, the, the glacier that I had started with, then maybe I can even go to that slide quickly. Um, that was more um, suitable for for uh, observation with SAR here, this one, perhaps you see it here, because mm -hmm. uh, the, there are two arms here, the right one called uh, Shishpar and the left one called Muchoar. So there are two separate glaciers actually, but they're converging into the same uh, valley point, sort of confluences together where we have this ice dammed lake. And here, uh, I was still able to use SAR pretty much. And the velocity mm -hmm. field that is presented there is actually computed with Sentinel-1. So, okay. yeah, we will try to use it more. OK. No, I mean, thank you. I mean, that's all from my, from my side. So I congratulate you again for, for, your, for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Means thanks, a lot. Carlos. Okay, then we can read the, the next one, which is, um, um, I don't know, and then do you like to read it? Um, or should I, I read it? I can't spot it. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, I can go. The Sentinel images is 10 meter resolution and the planet scope is about five meter. These two different spatial resolution satellite images are at extraction glacial lakes, maybe have some discrepancy. I mean, that's clear, right? And the question is how much difference about the glacial lake magnitude and area uh, in extracted, is, is probably extracted. So if, if there is an issue. Um, I, I think the, 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 the 
the question might refer to the fact that when we try to do digitization around the lake, uh, the Sentinel would, it has a bigger pixel dimension, of course. So along the edges, we would definitely expect planet scope imagery to give us a better estimate of the surface area. I think that's that that that's the case. So, uh, but we we still use planet to some extent because imagery is it's not open imagery planet, but still they had a cost they had an faculty account <laughs> it allows you to that to download some data so we thought to use higher resolution wherever we can so especially on smaller glaciers it makes sense to use it okay there's another question which model you have used for GLOF studies uh, so for the glacial lake um, classifications uh, so far it's a binary classification like you have lake or you have no lake we do want to go towards classification of the type of lakes from end moraine to cirque or to others but that would require a, a larger a data set with more features in it so so far we have used unit um, cnn with efficient net p0 uh, or uh, backbone so and used um, pre-trained weights from the ImageNet database. So that's the model we have used. Okay, and then there's a question: Have any vibration or acoustic signal analysis been done on the affected structure? Um, no, no. In our work, we have not done it. Um, I think it might be something very interesting, but uh, I am not familiar with the use of these uh, devices. Uh, perhaps um, in, in glaciologists would use it. Uh, I know of GPR studies that are done on glaciers, uh, but here um, it's another problem that it's not always easy to access the glaciers in terms of getting permissions from the authorities and taking a GPR up there is, is, is a difficult thing. But connecting it with the previous question where we have those, la lo those lakes which are not visible from remote sensing imagery directly because they tend to be beneath the, the, the ice mass, there it also makes more sense to use GPRs and try to see how is the subglacial hydrology. Uh, but yeah, we have not used it. And there's another question uh, referring to this uh, mountain parts and SAR, I think, because it's written here that uh, for layover and shadow, uh, there can be used a high mountain Asia dam with eight meter resolution in order to probably um, yeah, co-register and um, get rid of over, uh, layovers. Um, yeah, there was a question mark. Is, this, is it true? Can this dam be used? I assume this is probably the question. Uh, I, we, we definitely a higher resolution then will help us to geocode and georeference it better, especially when we are doing those stacking uh, sort of experiments. We have both SAR and optical in them. But uh, it, like when you have a shadow in SAR, you have a shadow in there. You, you, even after doing the georeferencing, you do not eliminate the shadow part. There is no backscatter coming from that area from that region which is in shadow. So when we you say eliminate or to remove, I think perhaps you mean uh, maybe replace the shadow uh, with some um, values that are sort of median values of the other regions around them or uh, something of that sort, but we haven't done it. Because if, if we only want to make masks of layover and shadow and remove those regions, then there's another problem because you have to feed them to the to the architecture and then you cannot feed it any end values. So it will complain that your your crop, image crop, has no not a number in it. So what do I do with it? So that's another issue. Um, I hope I managed to answer your concern that uh, we, we really don't uh, remove the layover or shadow from there but i think the way we would like to do it in future is to perhaps refill that masked out area with some median values 
Okay, and there's the last question, I think, before we need to close already the session. <laughs> And there's one from Aridam. It's again regarding Sentinel and Planet Scope. Image resolution uncertainty or error estimation of surface area could help. Um, I think I do not really complete. And, and then there's the next question to it. But in my opinion, the HMA dam has more data gaps in many regions of the Himalaya. No uh, elevation data. I think these are probably two questions here now. Uh, the one is again regarding Sentinel planet scope image resolution uncertainty um, that I probably think could help. The, Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think for the second question, you you can answer it even better. I think given the fact that the Tandem X DEM, I think it has not many holes. It doesn't have many gaps. I think it has been uh, sufficiently refined. So we are not using HMA DEM. Uh, because I think for the geocoding part at the moment, we have done it with SRTM. But to go one step ahead, we would probably go for Tandem X DM. And regarding the, the uncertainty or error estimation, I think um, we haven't done it ourselves, but if one has to do it, um, the shape files that we have prepared are at a high resolution in the sense that they have been made with planet scope. So once they get projected, on Sentinel imagery, one can do an analysis that, okay, the same lake uh, was uh, had a volume of uh, surface area visible this much, but then, but then you took it to Sentinel-2, doesn't come out to be exactly the same because the pixel dimensions are different. So one can do that, but uh, actually we haven't done it. So it would be hard for me to comment on it. Robbie, there was still one question I'll post in it. <laughs> And just let me do, do it very fast. Uh, for downstream flood velocity estimation, which model have you used? Uh, and what are the inputs you have provided to the model? For downstream flood velocity uh, estimation? Um, uh, I think you were showing one ah, slide okay, where you yeah. had this flooding region. Yeah, he, uh, here a very simple model called HECRAS, H-E-C-R-A-S has been used. It's a uh, from way back in the 80s and 90s, I think, uh, and was developed by hydrologists uh, for flow modeling of canals and rivers. And it has been applied in different contexts. And even here, uh, it, or, or let's say in the mountain context, it, it gives good or decent results. So the model is it HECRAS. Um, I, um, I, I'm sorry, I do not remember exactly the acronym, the full name of what HECRAS stood for but it's H-E-C-R-A-S. If you just Google it, perhaps it would lead you to that model. And I think it's openly available. So you can also download the C files and uh, implement it if you like, or just run it. Yeah, yeah, that one. Okay, yeah, perfect, great. <laughs> uh, and there's a very, very last question with a hand raised. So Arin Dam, please, you can just speak up if you like. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Arunjan from India. Actually, I'm also working on the glacial lakes since like six years. Uh, like, uh, my question is that how do you look into the, uh, the procession of a multi lake outbursts? Multi lake outbursts. Uh, so you, you mean multi lake outbursts? Yeah, yeah multi lake outbursts. Suppose one lake is in the bottom side. Uh, bottom belly and another lake is in the uh, I mean, it's a hanging lake over the uh, mm -hmm. means over that in the higher part of the elevation of the valley. So if that out uh, lake is outburst in the top, then obviously it will be the the, the down lake will uh, obviously it will also create a uh, means um, uh, process chain for the uh, outburst of the lower lake as well. So how do you look into that? Uh, I think it's. Uh... Uh, it's it's again hard for me to answer it directly because I haven't looked at those cases at so far. But I think if it's about how I would approach it, uh, I think if it is, let's say, in SAR image, if the incidence angle happens to be suitable, that I can look at both, I may be able to follow the evolution of both lakes independently and be able to, to see that one lake tends to get too big or both of them are, are getting beyond uh, the, the expected or usual volumes. Uh, but 
as I have heard or read about, such lakes are often connected to each other also. Like there are subglacial conduits where, where the two lakes yeah, are yeah, perhaps yeah. connected to each other. And in this case, uh, I think what would matter perhaps is, is the combined volume of the two. Uh, that whether the combined volume is tending to be suddenly too high compared to the usual volume. And I think, again, we might be able to give a holistic answer there that it, it, it as a whole, it's getting towards a, a dangerous situation or not. Um, but if, if because of the hanging scenario, if the other lake is just not visible uh, in the imagery, we might not be able to, to say much again there. So, so coming back to, to what I have been saying before, it is important not just to rely on, on optical as only the source of information. The more features we connect to it, the better. Polarimetry, interferometry, and change detection, coherence, everything we can we can use or, or get from SAR and optical, we should try with it. So we are also planning to, let's say, use NDVIs, uh, NDWIs, and, and see whether they can help us. So. I hope I could add to what you already knew, I think. Okay, I would say, sorry, now we need to really close it. <laughs> so thanks a lot for being so active as an audience. So we really appreciate to have so many questions. I think the last question from Xawen, Lee, uh, please, you can send an email to Adnan and he's really happy to answer it. Or even probably now in the chat, if you like, uh, however, we are now closing this session and thanks again to the speaker. Thanks, Adnan, for this great presentation and overview. And thank to, this, to the audience uh, for listening and uh, joining us. And please keep us, uh, yeah, keep, keep posted, right? And go to the website so then you know more about what we're doing uh, and also being available for the next uh, webinars. Okay, thanks a lot and uh, hopefully see you at the next webinar. Bye.